Did you ever wonder how pilots start an engine? Pilots follow a specific procedure in order to obtain two good engine starts. And if you stick to the end of this video, you should be able to successfully start a Boeing 737 engine yourself. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and thank you for watching this video. I hope you're all doing great today. Before I talk you through the actions and the actual engine start, I would like to tell you more about the buttons we press and why. Simply to give you a bit of an insight in why we perform these actions. Starting an engine requires pressurized air and electrical power. So the first step to start an engine is to have a source of electrical power and pressurized air, also called bleed air. There are three possible bleed air sources. The APU or auxiliary power unit. It's located in the tail of the airplane and it's actually an engine itself. The APU is the only engine that can be started by electrical power and it does not provide any thrust. It's just there to provide electrical power and generate air pressure for ground operations and emergencies. An air starter could be another possible bleed air source. An air starter can be mobile or fixed to the ground or a building. Usually it is connected to the air bridge and you can often spot a big yellow hose underneath the air bridge or a mobile cart. A third possible bleed air source can be the other engine when you already successfully started one of them. Starting an engine by using the other engine isn't considered a preferred method. This is however a preferred method for restarting an engine while in flight after it has failed and when it's considered safe to try and restart it again. Most of the time the engine will be started by use of an APU. I hope this makes sense until now and that you guys are still alive. Once we have the air supply sorted, we need to direct it to the engine starter. The engine starter works by supplying it with pressurized air so it can start the core of the engine. In order to get sufficient bleed air to the engine starters, we select both packs on the overhead panel to off, effectively shutting off the air supply to the cabin. That way, the bleed air pressure increases. As a passenger, you can notice this step as well. Just before the engine start is initiated, the air supply in the cabin stops until the packs are switched back to auto again after both engines have successfully started. If the isolation valve switch is in auto and the APU bleed air switch is in on, the APU should provide enough air to start the engines. The third step is to make sure we can ignite the fuel. And for that, we use two independent ignition systems, left and right. Starting with right, selected on the first fly of the day, provides a check of the AC standby bus, which is the only electrical source with the loss of thrust on both engines and no APU. Normally, in flight, no igniters are in use as the combustion is self-sustaining. So with the igniters in left or right, we select the engine start switches to ground, which opens the start valve closes the engine bleed air valve and arms the igniter to provide ignition when the start lever is moved to idle detent. The engine start switches switches to off after starter valve cutout. It does this because after a while it's no longer necessary to keep the starter running. If it doesn't switch back to off automatically, the pilots have to switch it off themselves. During engine start or takeoff and landing, ground and continuous use the selected igniters, left or right. In conditions of moderate or severe precipitation, turbulence or icing, or for an in-flight engine relight, flight should be selected to use both igniters. The last thing we need to successfully start an engine is of course fuel. And we should have plenty of that when we just start our engines. The fuel is fed to the engines by selecting the engine start lever from cutoff to idle the tent. Now that we have the basics covered, let's consider that we are cleared for push and start, okay? This means we are allowed to push the airplane to the taxiway and also allowed to start the engines. We communicate with the ground crew who are talking with the headset attached to the airplane to the taxiway while it's being pushed back to the taxiway. Once the area is clear, they will advise us that we are clear to start engine number two first. Engine number two is the right hand engine. Starting engine number two first is a standard procedure which can be changed when the conditions require us to do so. Whenever we start the engines using an air starter, for example, instead of the APU, we start the engine number one first because the air starter unit is connected to the airplane on the right side, on the engine number two side. The actions. 
Wish buttons, switches and levers to the pilot's press or move in order to successfully start an engine. I hope you are paying attention until now. Whenever we are clear to start engine number two, the first officer selects the air conditioning pack switches to off, the APU bleed air switch to on and the isolation valve switch to auto or open depending on the company procedures. The first officer announces the engine start and says starting engine number two, selects the engine start switch of engine number two to ground and presses the clock for the timing. Yeah. Two minutes is the maximum time in order for the engine to stabilize. Both the first officer and captain verifies that the N2 RPM increases. When movement of the front fan of the engine is seen, also called N1, the first officer calls N1 and verifies the oil pressure. When the core of the engine, also called N2, is at 25%, the captain moves the engine start lever from cutoff to idle detent. When the captain moves the engine start lever to idle detent, both first officer and captain monitor fuel flow and EGT indications. The captain keeps a hand on the engine start lever while monitoring the RPM, EGT and fuel flow until it's stable. At 56% of N2, the first officer verifies that the engine start switches moves to off automatically. If it doesn't, he or she will have to move the engine start switch to off manually. He or she will also verify that the start valve open light extinguishes when the engine start switch moves to off. At the call starter cutout, once again done by the first officer, both pilots monitor N1, N2, EGT, which exhausts gas temperature, fuel flow and oil pressure for uh, normal indications while the engine accelerates to a stable idle. After the engine is stable at idle, we start the other engine. The engine is called stable at idle when EGT start limit red line is no longer shown. The Boeing 737-400 comes with a few different limitations due to a different type of engine. Even though it's the same airplane, uh, specifications vary. During an engine start, the EGT start limit is 725 degrees. N1 cannot be greater than 106%, N2 cannot be greater than 105%. Whenever during an engine start the temperature exceeds that value, you will have to return to the stand. Apart from that, in order for the engines to start, the minimum start pressure at sea level is 30 psi. It should be decreased by 0.5 psi for every 1000 feet above sea level. Last but not least, in the Boeing 737-400, the engine start switch moves to off at 46% instead of 56%. What a bunch of numbers, right? I know that it's not the same as starting your car. So, whenever we have two good engine starts, the first officer starts and completes the before taxi procedure. But is this it? Not really, right? It's not guaranteed that an engine will just start and operate within limits. Therefore, there are some limitations when it comes to engine starts, which are very important. According to the standard Boeing procedures, the aborted engine start checklist must be done for one or more of the following conditions. EGT rapidly approaching or exceeding the start limit of 725 degrees. No oil pressure indications by the time the engine is stabilized at idle. No increase in or a very slow increase in N1 or 2 after the EGT indication. No increase in EGT within 10 seconds of raising the start lever to idle. And minimum of 25% N2 or 20% N2 at max motoring to move the start lever to idle the tent or insert the fuel. Any sooner could result in a hot start. A hot start is indicated by an abnormally rapid rising EGT after the light off. By monitoring the fuel flow and EGT, a hot start should be anticipated before 725 degrees limit is exceeded, usually caused by excess of fuel in the combustion chamber. A hung start is identified by an abnormally slow acceleration and RPM stabilization below idle. A hung start may be the result of fuel scheduling being either too lean or too rich. A lean hung start is associated with low fuel flow and also a low EGT. A rich condition can be recognized by a high fuel flow and the EGT rise which uh, may tend to develop into an over temperature condition and a possible compressor stall. The starter motor will continue to turn the engine but without assistance from the engine itself the start will hang with the RPM stagnating at typically less than 20%, often a result of low air pressure or voltage to the starter motor. A wet start is identified by a non-rising RPM 15 seconds after moving the start lever to idle the tent. I know, a lot of information, right? I hope that right now you have a general idea of how to start the engine of a Boeing 737. Next time you are pushing back, you know what's happening in the front. 
at least when you're flying in a Boeing 737. Check out my Instagram for daily posts and stories about my aviation life. And give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. I hope to see you in the next video, guys. Bye bye. And one, oil pressure. And one, air pressure.